unfortunately, my co-chair, Joan Jessam of the NSGEU, is unavailable this evening, but sends her very best wishes. On behalf of the coalition, I want to thank the Visiting Professor Medical Citizenship Committee um, for co-sponsoring this event with Dr. Haley, uh, Dr. David Healy as our keynote speaker. Very pleased to have Dr. Healy with us from all across uh, the pond from Wales. And uh, it's a little bit colder here than he expected, I understand. Yeah. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> we had a few days last week. As described by the committee, medical citizenship means every doctor has a voice and should use it. And every doctor's voice matters. If doctors cannot speak out, we have a problem. But obviously, this also applies to other health professionals and really all other persons affected or concerned with mental health issues. For the coalition, this means what are the challenges and prospects for speaking out and raising one's voice? What can be done about them and how does this apply to mental health? Our agenda tonight starts with Dr. Healy's presentation, moving on to a reaction panel composed of five people and moderated by Dr. Nick Delva, followed by an open discussion question and answer period, and then concluding with light refreshments and uh, an informal discussion. The coalition very much hopes that you find this evening to be interesting, informative, and perhaps even a little provocative. Um, to start us off, I will ask Gabrielle Horn from the uh, committee to introduce Dr. Healy. Thanks, Susan. Um, first of all, thank you so much to the Mental Health Coalition of Nova Scotia for putting on this very well-attended event and bringing the very crucially important voices of so many people through the whole umbrella of your organization to these important issues. Um, and thank you all for coming. Medical citizenship is about advocacy, and advocacy is about telling the truth as we see it publicly. And when you talk about advocacy in healthcare, telling the truth means telling the truth to power. And there are very powerful forces that shape our healthcare system. And for <coughs> doctors and other healthcare professionals, um, telling the truth publicly means speaking out to power, and that can involve government, um, university, hospital, and even large pharmaceutical companies. And Doctors in particular have a complicated relationship with those institutions and have a necessarily complicated relationship with power. And that makes <coughs> advocacy a very complicated and controversial topic for doctors and other healthcare professionals. And so to shine a healthy light on the importance of advocacy, our committee wanted to bring in extraordinary role models of advocacy to um, speak to as many groups as would want to have them visit and really shine a light on the importance of um, professional and personal courage in speaking out about what matters. And um, we have an absolutely extraordinary role model here today, Dr. David Healy, um, who's a professor of psychiatry from Bangor and Wales, but you'll notice his accent is actually from a little further west in Ireland. And he's extremely well-traveled, um, both in his training and in his work, and also in his education, educational advocacy. Um, Dr. Healy is particularly well-known for having been instrumental in shining a light on the link between SSRIs and suicide and violence. Um, so he played a pivotal role in that and um, has had to, uh, and had to stand up to very powerful forces in order for that data to be looked at properly. And he's also helped us to understand um, the relationship between conflicts of interest and how, um, and how drugs are evaluated and how the results of that are reported. And so he's an expert in that area as well. Um, so we're really very lucky to have Dr. Healy with us and um, more than anything, he can teach not just psychiatrists, not just mental health professionals, but all healthcare professionals about the importance of these topics, which also apply to the rest of medicine. Hi. Hello. My name is Amy Moonshadow, and I am the acronym for us, ZAR, 
that when you say an acronym, because not everybody comes from the same place and training and understanding and things, if you use an acronym, could you please, any and all of us, please say what it is, because it is a way of you know, sure. keeping people up. Absolutely. So, Dr. Healy knows much more about this than I do. So, SSRI was the one that you used. Sure. So, he knows much more about this than I do, but he's going to talk about the link between antidepressant medications and the risk of suicide. So, what is an SSRI? I'll explain it. Okay. Hi. Thank you. Very much, Gabrielle. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. One of the tricky things, though, is I'm going to talk about a very different topic to what you just outlined. I'm going to say it's not about speaking to this power. It's a slightly different thing. Um, th and uh, this could be a bit awkward, because you, you'll all have to work to translate, not just my accent, but the things that I have to say to try and get them to match or meet the needs that you have here. I've been just here for the last 24 hours, I've been listening for the last hour or two to what the issues are here and trying to get a feel for how the things I say, or could say, might work for all of you. You'll have to assume probably that the problems we face over in the UK are close to the ones that you <coughs> face here. Okay? Let me give you a little bit of background first. One is that uh, I believe the illnesses in the mental health field are real, just as real as anywhere else in healthcare that the, I use drugs to treat these conditions rather than anything else. One of the big risks I think you all have here is thinking that mental health is different to the rest of health. You risk creating a ghetto within the mental health field. The problems you've got within the mental health field, I think, uh, reflect, are, are happening elsewhere in healthcare also, people within cardiac medicine and renal medicine and orthopedic surgery are having the same kind of issues facing them. Patients going to seek treatment, doctors, nurses, and others trying to deliver treatment are facing the same problems that are happening within at the mental health field. And in order to try and move forward, I think you need to look out and try and engage with people from elsewhere in healthcare also. That leads me to where the differences are, I don't think it's about speaking truth to power, and I'm not an expert on how to do that. Lots of people in the room here are the experts on that, as you see. What it's about is much more about we're all facing a system that's causing problems for people within the pharmaceutical industry, within medicine, and people seeking treatment for their illnesses also. But I'm there are good people on all sides, within the pharmaceutical industry, within medicine, within nursing, and clearly patients also. You guys often think of us as the experts. What I'm going to try and persuade you is we're not, you often are, and that the future depends on us being able to work together. It's about how do we re-engineer the system rather than speak to its power. It's about we have a system in place that's giving us the wrong outcomes, all of us the wrong outcomes. How do we tweak the system to make the outcomes better? Now, this is a slide that looks like a truth to power slide. This was a lecture I gave 10, 15 years ago. And after the lecture, I was asked by a person I thought was a friend to give a talk about the issues about antidepressants causing people to become suicidal. After the lecture, these are notes that were taken by the pharmaceutical company that had called him to ask what I had said during the course of my lecture. He outlined the content of the talk and a few extra things you might want to know about Healy that might be useful for the company handling their Healy problem. <laughs> next slide. And this is a further note. You won't see this kind of thing often in a hurry. This is the group in the UK who are responsible for doctors being able to remain, remain registered or not. And this is the kind of letter which if you get it here or in the UK, it gives you gray hairs instantly. You age overnight. You think about trying to retire because you figure you're going to be caught up in a legal struggle for years trying to prove to people that you haven't behaved wrongly. Okay? And this is the GMC, it's called General 
Medical Council, asking, saying that they've had a complaint about the way I do things to them, and they have to investigate me. Go to the next slide, please. And again, this comes from a, a person that I thought was a friend. So this, this is going to look like truth to power. It's going to look difficult. It's going to look awkward. Go to the next slide, please. This one more bit. This is at, at the end of each year in the UK. I'm sure it's much the same here. We've got to, doctors like me have to prepare a plan about what we've done for the past year, what we're going to do for the next year or two, in terms of trying to keep us up to date. You know, how can we reassure the people who are responsible for registering us that we're doing all the things we need to do to know how best to treat the people who come to us seeking our help? And you'll see on um, this, I'm saying that uh, one of the key things I'm going to try and do for the next year here is to avoid getting sacked for practicing good medicine. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, what I'm saying to them is, and this is, this is an official document, that <coughs> if you want to do the right thing, it's going to lead doctors to the kind of point where they're at risk of getting sacked. Now, <coughs> The key point that I want to make is this, that this looks like it must be very difficult to be David Healy doing the job, but actually the problems I'm having here are nothing compared with the average patient taking an adverse event on a drug to their doctor anywhere in healthcare. Okay, you've seen a hint of the forces that are at play here, well actually, it's a much scarier thing, and the forces are even more obviously at play when a patient, any with any problem at all, goes into their doctor and tries to raise the issue of, doctor, the drug you just put me on is causing me problems. And that's the issue that I want to try and pick up from here on and try and engage you all with. If you take a flight from Halifax to Los Angeles, you put your life in the hands of the pilot. You do it because you know if you go down, she's going down as well. If you end up deaf, if you don't get to Los Angeles, neither does she. So you know that she's critically concerned with you getting there in one piece. The other thing about it is if she reports a near miss, an, an adverse event, things going wrong, you know the system's going to pay heed to her because if they don't, she and everybody else that pilots planes isn't going to fly again. They just will not get into a plane. You assume doctors and pilots are rather the same, but they're not. When doctors report uh, an adverse event, well, if they report, first of all, if you have an adverse event uh, on a drug, doctors don't necessarily report it. Lots of them, most of them, don't get reported. The next problem is if doctors do report it, these things are filed away. The system pays no heed. And the third thing is that, well, your doctor, if you have an adverse event on treatment, if you're injured or killed, your doctor isn't injured or killed. If she begins to speak up about the problem, though, she risks getting into the same kind of position that you're in. She risks getting into the same kind of position that I've been in, which is the system's going to come down on her. The companies, the government, no one wants to hear about things going wrong on the treatments we give. Okay? Here's the next slide, please. Oh, don't go that one. Try to get this over. We have, and here's a key thing. Some Months back, I had one of my research colleagues who was a nurse in her mid-30s. She had a higher degree. She knew healthcare. She was the kind of person you would have felt if things were going wrong on treatment would have been well able to handle the issues. She knew the system. She worked in the hospital that these issues happened in. For years and years and years, she knew the people, everything about it. Okay? So she had, she had a minor skin problem. And she's put on an antibiotic called doxycycline for it. In rare instances, this can make people agitated and can even make them become suicidal. Okay? 
we could see on the outset when she had done this bill that she began to become tense and irritable and agitated. Aren't okay? So um, those of us who who uh, well, I mean, we didn't know she was on this bill, but on the outside we could see you know, she must be on a pill of one sort or the other. Asked and she said yes, she was, and we sort of said, look, you know, you ought to talk to it, and she did. Things improved. But she still had her minor acne problem. So, as it turned out, the dermatologist we have in, uh, in the hospital is the nicest doctor you could possibly meet. A charming man, terribly sympathetic, the kind of person, if you had a wife or a husband or children or whoever that needed help, you'd say, well, he's the man to go to. Okay, of all the doctors in the hospital, you'd have said he was the, the best, the, the one that would be most open to issues, okay? So I dropped an email, asked him would he get to see her, uh, and he said, sure, fine. Uh, so she went over to him, and she went into him and raised the issue of, look, uh, I was put on this antibiotic for the skin problem I have, and it made me agitated, and it even made me suicidal. And he blew her away. He said, totally impossible, can't happen. Registered in her notes, look, a uh, woman has become suicidal. Didn't say it was caused by the pills, Get instantly giving her a mental health problem that could compromise her career if she wanted to work with kids. So this brought out for me awfully well just how scary and tricky the issues can be. And trying to convey all this, I recently, oddly enough, weird, don't take this as name calling or anything, or our hopefully not name calling, that's not quite what I want. Dropping names. I, I had to give a talk at the House of Commons recently, okay, on these issues, okay. So I'm Irish, as you know, and I was thinking, well, what's the way to convey to these guys how difficult it can be to be a patient? So I thought of an example. Does anyone know about the Guildford Four, the IRA, or anything like that? Well, the IRA, as you know, have the Irish have had their issues with the English from. Time. And the IRA took their particular approach towards the issues, which, you know, tricky one. But in the middle of all this, in the mid 80s, there was a bar in a place called Guildford. And four innocent people got locked up. They were the ones who were fingered as being at the cause of the whole thing. It became clear early on that they hadn't caused the problem. All kinds of efforts were made to try and free them. And there was a response from the justice system in the UK, which I think gets quite well the problems facing anyone who's a patient in healthcare these days, if you have an adverse event. Give the next slide. The Chief Justice in the UK said of the Guildford Four, if their story is right, this is such a horrific thing that it can't be. Wrongfully convicted prisoners should stay in jail rather than be free and risk a loss of public confidence in the law. <laughs> it's the same for a patient with an adverse event. The government and your doctors and the healthcare system don't want to risk people losing trust in the system. Okay? So if you have an adverse event, it isn't happening. You're the problem, not your pillow. Now, that's a system we've got that I'm going to talk about in a lecture on Thursday evening, a public um, talk that I'm giving on Thursday evening that you can all come to. We'll try and outline to you how we've ended up, where we've ended up, which is here, okay? The thing for us now here this evening is, how do we change this? And it's not about speaking truth about so much as trying to tweak the system so it works better. We have that. What the system we have hopes is that when treatments work, they, they could be made a, available for free. Because if we cure your illnesses, ensure that you don't die, get you out of a hospital bed and things like that, whatever the cost of the drugs, it's going to be cheaper than using hospital beds. And this is the general pitch to you know, at the government inquiry in the healthcare that companies and others are offering us. They'll make us more functional and things allow we'd be able to do our jobs better if only we can get access to the treatments that we need. The problem we've got, I've been listening to the group you're going to hear from later on after me, people have been saying there's a lot of underfunding and the pharmaceutical industry will agree with you. People will talk about the 
criminalization of people within mental health care, but that applies across the board in healthcare generally. We make drugs available on prescription only. In essence, we treat patients as addicts. This is a system that was introduced to handle addictions. But whether you're taking a respiratory drug or a cardiac drug or a renal drug, you're being treated the same way. And companies, because of this, can focus their attention on doctors who are the ones who actually, from the point of view of the company, consume the pills. So the companies, I mean, it isn't you who actually consumes pills. You think you're the consumer of medicines. You're not. Your doctor is, and he or she consumes by putting the pill in your mouth. So they don't get the adverse events. So companies focus their entire attention on doctors generally. And there's one or two other things. No, no. move on. Can we go to the next slide, please? So in terms of the problem we have, there's two ways that can, things can be solved. You can take a top down approach towards things or a bottom up. <laughs> a shower approach or a day approach. Next slide, please. The top down approach is the things we've got to leave to uh, the politicians. And that involves issues about but this does involve issues about the, the system. It involves things like the the way drugs are are patented. These things can be changed. The kind of system we have at the moment is probably not producing the best drugs and not producing them at the cheapest prices. There's the issue of drugs being available on prescription only. The assumption here is that your doctor is a person who's skeptical about the use of, of drugs and is going to be keeping a lookout for you in, in the way that a pilot would be if you were on the plane. Now the question we've got to ask is, is that working? And if it's not, what can we do about it? The answer may not be to make drugs available over the counter. may be trying to train doctors better to listen in a way that they don't do it. There's issues about controlled trials, bringing drugs in the market through the controlled trials. The question is, is this the best way to do things, particularly when the data from those trials gets hidden? Companies run the trials these days. They don't publish all of the trials. They often publish or let the world know about less than half of the trials that they do. But in either the published trials or the unpublished trials, the data gets hidden. If I was come here and claim that I had a treatment that was helpful for whatever, overweight or whatever, and refused to let you guys see the data behind that claim, it would be the end of my career. But, but uh, the pharmaceutical companies do this the whole time. And all of us, doctors, politicians, will let them get away with this. So these are all top-down issues that need input from from the from from uh, from the from the politicians to handle. But I'm interested here now with uh, the bottom-up issues and what we can do to maybe change things from the bottom up. Can we go to the next slide, please. And um, this is, <laughs> along with colleagues, I've been involved in having great thing called risk.org, and you're going to see a bit more about this now in a moment. What we've thought for a while is that the missing data in healthcare is the data on adverse events on drugs. Adverse events on drugs are anything between the third leading cause of death at the moment, or perhaps even the leading cause of death, but the data is missing. No one can really get access to what a drug actually does, what the adverse events on a drug have been. The main reason for companies to hide the controlled trial data is to hide the adverse events data. The adverse events on drugs probably are a major contributor to the drugs budget these days. They lead to doctors often using other drugs to treat the first drug that's causing problems, rather than recognizing the problem that the first drug is causing, and maybe just lowering the dose. It may not be a case of trying to take you off drugs completely, and maybe just trying to work out well, what's the right drug for you. The issue about what, you, what we get as a pitch about drugs can, if we just treat illnesses, that will save lives, get people out of hospital beds, and even, we can even make these treatments uh, available for free if they work. But the key thing here is if they work for you, as opposed to if they work generally. And that's the missing bit. Um, <clears throat> can the next slide, please? So this is risk 
www.google.org, and there's a little, well, there's a big conflict of interest here, and linked into this, it's a, an adverse event reporting system. Okay, the idea is we make the data that FDA have a, available on drugs, and Health Canada have also. It's 4.8 million reports on adverse events from drugs across medicine available to all of you, both doctors and patients, for free. You can just go in and have a look at all the things that have actually been reported to be caused by the drug in your life. But what we're hoping you do, both doctors and patients, is that you go in and report on the drug you're on, and particularly if it's causing you an adverse event. The philosophy, though, isn't just about adverse events. It's things happening on drugs, which might be an adverse event for you, but it's often the best way to discover new drugs for other conditions. So we ask you also to think not just about this as a bad thing, but to think about what the things are that this adverse event could potentially be useful for, are, we also ask you about, have you found other ways to handle it? Not just, is it bad and do you need to get off the pill, but can you think of any other ways to handle the issue? And one of the business also trying to get you to generate and print out a report which you take to the doctor who's put you on the drug, or maybe the pharmacist <coughs> you have the drug from, trying to get their input also on whether it's likely that the drug has caused the problem or not. Our hope is to get reports which no one else has, but both the doctor and the patient agree that this is actually causing a problem. Okay, that the problem you think that you're having is linked to the drug or not. It could be that when you bring the issue to your doctor, he or she will be able to point out, well, no, it isn't this drug. It's, it's, it's of the two or three drugs you're on, you think it's drug A, but maybe it's drug B or C, or it could be coming from a completely different source. Okay, the next slide. This is a bit more about risk.org. We don't just <coughs> focus on drugs and kill you and things like that. This is an old slide that's been updated. We focus on things like uh, the effect of drugs on your hair, for instance. Um, just to give you a feel of things, you often again think that it's doctors and experts who will be able to work out does a drug cause a problem or not. But in the case of Mark, well, since drugs went uh, uh, on prescription only from 1962 onwards. Among the first drugs we put on prescription only from that period onwards were the oral contraceptives. And it was recognized early on that they caused hair changes. And that, we didn't get that from doctors reporting it. That came from women <coughs> and their hairdressers. <laughs> As it turns out, for lots of drugs, the antidepressants and all kinds of drugs, like on antidepressants, most doctors don't know that hair extensions don't take when you're taking SSRIs, and hair color doesn't take. There's all kinds of things like that. There's a huge wealth of knowledge about what drugs do that you guys have, but we don't. There are issues about adverse events like injuries and death and that, which are clearly extraordinarily serious, but in uh, the skin zone here, we try and pick up the issue that for lots of people worldwide, if you're on a drug that darkens skin at all, this can be a huge political problem. You know, so there's adverse events that are issues for the person on the pill that typical healthcare often doesn't recognize all that well. But the key thing here is that, and this, this comes back to uh, an issue which is the ghetto issue. Within mental health care, many of you think that patients have become invisible. What our thinking is generally that the invisibility that mental health care patients have is actually one that's shared by patients throughout medicine who are having an adverse event. They all become invisible. <coughs> They're having a drug traffic accident, as it were, and nobody wants to know about it. Mm -hmm. So, what you get when you go to a start is this. You, you get an opportunity to print out a report about the adverse event that you're having. Can you press that, please? We take you through a bunch of questions, the kind of questions an expert would take you through, trying to work out 
has this drug cause problem view, and this gives you a score. And the idea is to print out the problem you have with the score and take it to the doctor, or uh, put you on the drug, or maybe the pharmacist that you got the drug from, and try to get their input. It looks like this. It's just a bunch of the questions that you get printed out on the report. On the next slide, please. And it gives you an image of when the issue began, when the drug began, when the adverse event, or whatever it was that happened on the drug, also began. Now, this is one more bit of what we're trying to do here. This is adverse events, liver problems in people taking Paxil. And you see that almost all the reports, even though this is data that's stored, are the data that's picked up by FDA, almost all the reports come from Japan. And part of our thinking here is that if you're asking people in FDA, here, that's, um, FDA is the Food and Drugs Agency. It's the, it's, uh, and it's a body down in uh, the States that are responsible for letting drugs on the market and trying to track things like the adverse events that the drugs may be causing. If you're asking FDA to work out what's going here, on here, why do we get liver problems from Japan, FDA aren't the people to do it. We think that the best people to be able to answer that are going to be the Japanese. In the same kind of way, if people on Halifax are on a drug, the people in Toronto are also having, but there's a problem about turning pink in this drug here in Halifax, and nobody who takes a drug over Toronto turns pink. Our hunch is that it's people in Halifax and <coughs> Toronto who are going to be able to work out what is it about the air in Halifax versus the air over Toronto are, is it the fact that you also eat lobsters here and they don't eat them over Toronto? <laughs> what is it? It's going to be local knowledge that's going to give us the answer to why this is an issue here and this is one over there. The, this is a little bit <laughs> the problem. We've moved from a world where in the 1950s, when you turned pink or turned blue on a pill and went to your, your doctor, he was able to recognize what was happening to you and stop the pill. And if the thing cleared up, then it was obvious the drug had caused the problem. He wrote the issue up in, a, uh, in an article that went to a good journal who were happy to report or to publish his observations. What happens now is if you're on a drug and things go wrong, your doctor looks at you and looks at the evidence base, and there's no evidence that the drug has actually caused the problem. So he's inclined to say, well, no, you know, this drug couldn't cause you to turn blue. We're just feeling awfully anxious about this. And if the drug is one for your nerves, what you'll often do is double the nerves, which is exactly the wrong thing to do if the drug has been causing the problem. What he's looking at, though, is rather than the doctor looking at you, and you and the doctor who are faced with the issue uh, coming to a view of has this drug caused the problem or not, he's looking to a bureaucrat over in the regulatory apparatus, who's there because maybe they have a background in healthcare, but they don't like meeting patients often. That's why they're in <laughs> the office. Or if they did like meeting patients, and things like that, they're still in this office and they've been there for years, and they've never maybe used the pill the doctor has just given you for the condition he's just given it to you for. So they, they, they just aren't in a position to make the same judgment call about if the pill has caused the problem or not, as you and your doctor are in. So what we need to do is try and reverse the culture that we've got, which is at the moment people almost don't see the evidence in front of their own eyes anymore. They're looking to the evidence base <coughs> instead, rather than working from the lived experience of the person who's on the pills and the experience of the, of the, of either uh, the doctor or the nurse who's been using this pill. Here's the next slide, please. When, uh, when I give this talk, Every so often I pitch the issues this way, and this thing that can be a, a bit tricky. I say to doctors, <coughs> if for instance the, and when this can go in the context of, of the 
antidepressant group of drugs called the become suicidal. The response often when the issues came up first from doctors was, no, they don't. These are great and wonderful pills that work awfully well and don't cause problems. The more doctors repeat that in the current world we're in, if the drugs, the response to people who run healthcare these days will often be, well, if the pills work all that well and are so free of problems, why do we need expensive prescribers? We're increasingly training nurses to do prescribing, our pharmacists, our others. Do we need expensive prescribers? And it seems to me that, the, that it's very important from doctors' point of view if they're going to survive that they need to recognize that uh, they need to give a message which is closer to the interests of the patient, which is these pills can be helpful but aren't universally helpful. They can cause problems and it needs a person who's an expert, not just in the pills, but in working with patients to be able to recognize this. And we need to get back to the art of medicine, not being about putting you on pills, but often the expert is the person who knows when to take you off a pill and how to take you off a pill. Goodness. These are the kinds of things we've lost. We're in a world these days where you come in and say the pain started the day my daughter left home and the nurse or uh, the doctor is just using a rating scale, a checklist of questions, rather than being with you. We're in a world where no one wants doctors to have a professional judgment anymore, and even doctors aren't sure they want to have it. Okay? It's how to get back to that kind of world. One of the things we're wondering about doing with risk.org, and it's going to be interesting to see what you all think about it, is <coughs> introducing the idea of a quality mark. A patient brings a report to the, to, uh, the doctor that's put them on the pills, and quality marks the doctor in terms of did they listen or not. It's a, a way for patients to, be able to exercise leverage within the system. Okay? In due course, if some doctors get a reputation for listening and being open to the issues, patients generally will be able to go to them rather than to the ones that don't listen. And that's a way to change the ones that aren't listening into doctors that do listen. One of, one of the key things I've learned about all this, though, comes, what comes back to is this. You tend to think of doctors as the experts. And, and that's not the way these things work out, it seems to me. Having spent the last few years dealing with adverse events across medicine, one of the things that I've come to learn a lot is that the experts are often the patient on the pill. Mm -hmm. They're motivated to find the answers to the issues. Motivated even when they haven't trained in healthcare, have dropped out of school early to go into the internet and try and work out, well, what does this drug work on? What's the biochemistry of it? They train, they can often be <coughs> motivated to train themselves up on these issues. It's crazy for medicine not to work with people like this. Maybe the best way to put it over is this. We're in a very market-based healthcare these days. What we need to try and restore is a sense that medicine and healthcare is more like a family than a market. There are market issues there, but it's more like the relationship between parents and children. Now, in the 1950s, it was one where the parents were the ones who laid down the laws for the children. But it's much more these days the relationship, if you call doctors, parents, and patients, children, it's much more like the relationship where if you are a parent these days over the age of 30 or 40, you have to have children as a digital interface. You can't make the world work without kids programming a computer and kids to sync the phone with God. They know how to do it. In the same way, patients these days, rather than be the children they were during the 1950s, maybe, are now often the experts in what the pills are doing and how to make healthcare work. And the idea that medicine wouldn't be working with experts like this is just crazy. So, I'm going to try, uh, I'll be giving a talk on Thursday evening, which I hope uh, a few of you here in the room will be able to come to. It's called The Shipwreck of the Singular. And it's about how we've lost the ability to pay heed to the individual person in the room. Those of us within healthcare have lost that. Those of us who have healthcare 
problems and also it's also increasingly hard for you to find a person who will connect with you. And it's how we got to that point. So that's list.org. Um, it's a conflict of interest to shape this talk the way I have because I'm so linked into list.org. So conflicts of interest aren't a totally bad thing. Doctors should have conflicts of interest. Patients should have also. You want the best evidence. You want the best treatments. You don't want to think that everything's just equal. Uh, there should be a passion behind the whole thing. Um, okay, thank you very much. presentation from a number of different perspectives and experiences. Don Matak from the HRM chapter of the Schizophrenia Society of Nova Scotia. Right here, Don. Um, uh, we'll introduce Dr. Nick Delva, who will introduce and moderate our panel. May I ask the five panelists to come forward, please, and take a seat? Delva received his medical degree and did his residency in psychiatry at Queen's University, Kingston, Ontario, where his training and research was uh, supervised by the late Dr. Felix Letamudia. His clinical work has been in, gen uh, in general adult psychiatry, particularly focused on the care of patients with mood disorders and schizophrenia. As a researcher, Dr. Delva has been interested in biological psychiatry, including psychopharmacology, clinical trials, <coughs> sleep deprivation for depression, electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, and the polydisia water intoxication syndrome. In recent years, Dr. Delva has focused his energy on the maintenance and development of the Department of Psychiatry at Dalhousie University. Please welcome Dr. McDelva. Well, in uh, recent years, it's been my pleasure to be a member of the Mental Health Coalition. Yeah, no, I'm So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, very happy to, uh, to moderate this uh, panel and uh, to uh, meet Dr. Kelly for the first time. Um, sorry I missed the uh, presentation, but I had these uh, previous uh, commitments. And uh, so what I'd like to do uh, is just introduce um, the uh, panelists. And, uh, and um, I would uh, wonder if we should perhaps be having Dr. Healy up on the panel here as well, right? Yeah. So, why don't you come up and sit right here? Yeah. Maybe at the far end, I can So, for starters, uh, I'm going to, uh, I think, I'm ask Dr. Uh, Tian to come up. And um, uh, Dr. Tian um, 
uh, <coughs> someone I work very closely with, and uh, this year he has the distinction of being president of the Canadian Psychiatric Association, which is taking him all across the country to meet many, many uh, different people, and uh, and uh, it's been, I think, a very busy and exciting year for him. And um, he uh, just returned, I think, from Alberta, was it? Ontario. Ontario. <coughs> Alberta, one week from here and then. Um, Dr. Tian uh, has um, served uh, served uh, um, our profession very well over a very long period of time, and uh, has had a number of roles within our department, including you know being the director of postgraduate education, being clinical director, and he's been deputy head of the department of psychiatry for a number of years, working very closely with me. So, with that very brief introduction, I'll ask uh, Michael to come up and uh, and uh, give his uh, presentation. Thank you, Nick. Um, what he didn't tell you is that he's my boss, and uh, it's been very worthwhile my coming here tonight because uh, I looked at Dr. Healy's, uh, Professor Healy's uh, yearly review. Mine is coming up very shortly, and I was promptly asked not to be sacked to uh, find my ways to prevent that happening. Um, well, I knew that we were going to live up to reputation by, by Dr. Healy when on his first slide uh, I noticed the words fascism and uh, stalking. Um, <laughs> difficult enough as it was to see, but they were fairly prominent. And indeed he has provoked us, I think, as he has been doing for a number of years, um, very successfully. Uh, it might surprise him that for one of the establishment, as it were, to, be, to say that I totally agree with him about the reporting of adverse events um, in almost everything that he laid out for you today. Uh, they are the number of reports that actually reach those bureaucrats behind the shelves are paltry, um, and when they are received, they are paid little attention. Um, and so, as he was talking about this, I was hoping that he was going to say, and the solution is. Uh, and indeed, I think he has laid out at least a way or a piece of the way to the solution of, of uh, better reporting, uh, accurate reporting, comprehensive reporting, and then using what's reported in, in a way that makes, makes sense, that can actually be um, uh, analyzed and fed back so that we have something that comes out of this system that he has uh, been proposing or that is, is operating, uh, I hope, successfully. Um, so I'm conscious we have five uh, other, <coughs> four other members of the panel tonight, and I was asked to be very brief, but uh, those would be my initial reactions to uh, a very, very interesting and very popular talk. Thank you, Professor Hill. circumstances into positive ones by devoting his time to improving the lives of those who also live with these issues. Uh, he's in the midst of his education at the moment, working towards a degree in recreation therapy, working for Healthy Minds Cooperative, providing peer support to individuals transitioning from the hospital to the community. He's in the process of becoming a nationally certified peer supporter. Um, he's also been involved in uh, stand-up for mental health training, becoming a stand-up comedian and uh, providing many Nova Scotians with best medicine, which is laughter. So maybe I'll give us a taste of those skills this evening. <laughs> All right, thank you, Dr. Go. Um, so even before hearing Dr. Healy's lecture tonight, I saw that uh, they were talking today about doctors' voices and you know doctors need to speak out to transform the medical system. And it made me think about a year ago, uh, there was a health care forum at Dalhousie put on, and uh, it was kind of like this with a panel and everything, and they were passing out literature before the evening started. And there were a list, there was a list of 10 recommendations from the Canadian Medical Association on uh, 
ways to transform and improve the healthcare system. Out of those 10 recommendations, mental health wasn't mentioned once. They mentioned dental health, but they didn't mention mental health. And so it just got me thinking, if doctors' voices are gonna be so important in transforming the healthcare system, uh, maybe the leading doctors of our country need to get their collective heads out of their asses and realize that mental health is a serious medical condition that needs more attention. Um, so, on a personal note, I guess the reaction um, to what he had to say, uh, it made me think of my experience in hospital after uh, you know, a bad manic episode um, and how I was put on the medications that I'm now taking. I was just told, do you need these medications? I'm on three of them. And, uh, you know, it took him a bit of time to talk me into it, but then, you know, I, I succumbed and started taking the meds. But there was no talk of how to handle the side effects. Uh, the side effects of my meds, I think, like a lot of uh, psych psychiatric meds, were uh, weight gain, uh, bowel and stomach problems, dehydration, uh, a tremor in my left hand. And so uh, I remember specifically nothing being told about the side effects of these meds or warnings or, or anything like that. Maybe if they did adequately warn you about the side effects, a lot of people would really not want to take them. But um, it became obvious that these meds really helped me. And uh, I'm lucky now that I have a psychiatrist who, over the course of about a year, he became my coach in uh, decreasing the side effects. So simple things like I needed to drink more water, uh, I needed to take uh, some. I need to eat some food before I went to bed. Uh, before taking my pills, uh, things like this that you know wasn't mentioned really once in the hospital, and so um, that would just be nice to see. I think uh, for anyone who's who's been on the pills like me, uh, managing the side effects can be a huge thing. But if it's not even mentioned when you're first put on them, it can be a real daunting task. And mate, I know just from friends saying uh, they went off those meds because of the side effects, but. What I learned is that the side effects are manageable and under the care of a good doctor, uh, you know, you can go on and get rid of those side effects like I have. So uh, that's what I got to say, I guess. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Ms. Holly Took. Um, she's been a Halifax Regional Police Officer for over eight years and has worked in general parole as a community officer and has also done a stint in the public relations officer in the public relations office where she served as backup spokesman for the police service. She's passionate about community and helping others. As an officer, she's seen the effects that poor mental health can have on individuals and families and our community as a whole. I'd like to say I was very unprepared, but I did do a little bit of research beforehand. Um, I wrote stuff, but I'm not going to, it's always dangerous when you don't stick to your script. Um, I'll just kind of give you an idea. A lot of people don't understand. I, I certainly didn't understand at first why I would be asked to come talk at a lecture about mental health and how it works in the uh, medical field, I guess. Um, I think it's important that people understand police officers are a part of the circle of care for mental health clients. Um, we have a lot of work as police officers to do to get on board and bring ourselves up to snuff in the community and helping the clients that we run into pretty much on a daily basis. Um, one of the things that I know that we're working on, recognizing that a lot of police officers come from a lot of different backgrounds, we have tried to have a baseline for understanding of mental health issues. And as part of that, we take regular training where we all are on the same page, and then we go from there. Our next level that we've tried to introduce is the uh, crisis intervention team. And that's a 40-hour intensive uh, training for officers, and eventually will also be for our dispatchers. So that just gives us more tools to be able to deal with the actual issue. It's not, mental health issues sometimes get lost. I, don't, I shouldn't say sometimes, they get lost when it comes to policing. And as a police officer, I would say I'm sorry for that. 
personally, I'm sorry for that because we are the face that people see a lot of times when they're in crisis, and sometimes it's not the face that you need to see. One of the other things um, that we've also worked on is a mobile mental health crisis team to respond to those types of issues where we have clinicians going out with police officers who are not in uniform. So you already break down those preconceived notions of an officer coming into your home and dealing with a mental health issue. Um, we're working towards having more of our officers trained and it's something that is our goal to have as a regular annual uh, training module for our officers. Um, emotionally disturbed persons forms. I know that kind of sounds really technical and not very warm and snugly a term, but for us that's what our forms are called. These forms get reviewed on a daily basis and it's by clinicians, it's by the mobile mental health crisis team. So now we can start, instead of dealing with the criminalization of a mobile or a, a mental health issue, we can deal now with the medical side of things, earlier intervention, so that it's not the police coming to take you and arrest you and take you away. We're doing those types of things in our department. Um, our hope is that by early intervention medically, it'll reduce the criminalization of a mentally ill person. Um, where do we go from here? Lots more training and lots more conversation between stakeholders. This is great to be invited. I still don't know what the heck I'm doing up here. <laughs> but I do, I do connect with a lot of the things that he said. One of them in particular, and I'll say this because it's almost every time we go to a talk, or any time we go, excuse me, to sit down with someone um, having a crisis at some point, is no one listens to them. The doctor, it's not working. That's what struck a chord with me was, it's not working. There's so many of our clients that say, my medication isn't working, it's not working, and no one's listening to me. So that's one thing that really struck a chord with me, and I think we all would agree with you, uh, whether we're police or not, that we have to listen more, and we have to put a little bit more trust in the person that is telling us their story. So I would, I would say thank you very much for the, for the invitation, and thank you very much. She's a wife and mother of two, and now a grandmother, and wants to uh, have a life filled with less pain and more joy. Um, she's very um, interested and inspired by the stories and the struggles of others, and is now uh, embarking on an education to become a peer support worker. Um, I think it's uh, she's providing coaching with a peer perspective at Soup Cafe. A social enterprise operated by Colchester East Hands Branch at CMHA. Um, so, with that very brief introduction, I'll ask you to come in. Thank you. issues and as someone who's in recovery their self so a um, um, couple of things that were uh, really stood out to me um, was the talk about the medications and the suicide and things like that I know for myself a few years ago when I was really unwell um, I attempted suicide by medication and Ironically, it was medication that I was taking that was supposed to be keeping that from happening to me. Um, but uh, and nobody said anything about it. The doctors never even went on that. That was it was just total hush and silence. So I didn't ask any questions. I wasn't well enough to be thinking about that probably at that time. But it certainly has sparked a lot of thought for me here tonight <laughs> to think about that a whole lot more. Um, and. 
and for being here tonight, I'm really new at doing any of these kind of public talking. This is my second time this so far since I've been uh, out of college and kind of starting out on my new career. So, but, but really, and again, at the very latter part of, of the talk on um, the disconnect from, from the regulators and the people with the lived experience and the doctors listening to to the patients about what's going on, what's working and what isn't working. And the idea that we are experts, we certainly are experts of our lived experience. And that's one of the reasons why I, I guess I'm here tonight to talk to and to share something I learned from through my recovery and going back to college and everything was that it, it, it came to me that if I don't share what have my experiences are for myself, or I don't share what my son's experiences have been. How does anybody know that we may need a different types of interventions and things? So I just I warned my two adult kids that mom was going to go public. <laughs> she had lived with mental health issues, and uh, uh, surprisingly, uh, neither of them they were okay with that. And uh, so I can share their experiences also to help everyone that might have need some help. advisor to the Associate Deputy Minister of Mental Health Addictions in the Department of Health and Wellness. Her PA degree from Nelson University in 1980 and then a Master's degree in Applied Clinical Psychology from Memorial in 1988. And uh, she practiced as a child psychologist in Alberta, Nova Scotia, and then joined the mental health program in the IWK in 1998. And then uh, she got very involved with uh, the Autism Initiative back in mid uh, 90s, I guess you call them, 2005. <coughs> and uh, became Director of Children's Services in 2006. And, uh, so uh, 2011 appointed as Special Advisor to the Associate Deputy Minister, as I mentioned, and uh, also, as I mentioned, the memo strategy is Patricia. <laughs> strategy administration and implementation. It's a delight to see someone here. There's uh, hardly a seat in the place, so that's uh, very exciting. So thank you all for coming. Uh, apparently, I am the uh, token bureaucrat that you can lend. <laughs> I'll also mention that I think uh, originally our minister was invited, and he wasn't available, so it sort of worked its way down to me. And I understood that he was going to be the first to speak, but I'm going to be on the last to speak. So that just tells me where I fall in uh, anyway, um, this was uh, sort of a very interesting talk, and I, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to be saying in reaction to it. Um, I think for a long time we, we have not listened, certainly, to uh, our clients and patients uh, in the mental health and addictions world. And uh, if anything, this stresses that that's a really important thing to do. And so I would, uh, I would certainly support that. Uh, I'm a little disheartened to know that uh, things like adverse events don't make their way up to uh, the people that need to know about that. Um, I guess my experience in government is not that we uh, want bad things to happen to people at all, so uh, that's, uh, that's very concerning. Um, I think we are looking more at uh, quality and patient safety. I think uh, we are looking at uh, the effects of drugs. Um, we're looking at uh, some of the problematic use of, uh, of uh, substances and medications. And uh, so uh, it's not too soon to be doing that because clearly uh, it's a big problem and perhaps bigger than we thought. Um, again, I just stress the importance of really listening to the people that we're talking to and meeting with. And I guess uh, that's the, the one key thing that I, I would take away from this talk and would say that uh, it's really important and maybe um, you know, certainly on the government side of things, uh, that's a message we need to get across, and it certainly is a message that we convey uh, pretty regularly. And I, I'd like to think that it, it is getting better. I think uh, the stigma around mental health uh, and mental illness is 
uh, is uh, decreasing a bit. It's it's huge, so uh, when you have such a big uh, glacier to chip away at, it's going to take a while. But I, I think we are making progress, and I think that's uh, that's really important. And uh, I think the government is paying attention. Um, we have been spared some of the uh, cuts that have come through government, and uh, they did fund the strategy at a time when funding wasn't coming um, through, and uh, the new government certainly hasn't uh, messed with it. So. Um, hopefully it's onward and upward, but uh, very important messages out of this talk, and I was very pleased to be here. Thank you. very um it was very good i met a lot of officers that didn't know what they were talking about mental health they didn't know what they were doing but you um you took me and um i, I must say i i thank you very much for you your appreciation I was very nervous but thank you <laughs> thank you i'm just a person yeah. <laughs> but you were but you were somebody up there though thank you welcome Yes, thank you, this officer here. Help me out, Brock. Yes, I, I did. I read it because uh, that company, I don't know if you call it now, and they all, pretty sure you know, all came in and helped me. So if you get in the hospital and get my help, straight away, you get with medication. That's how I don't hate myself, I don't kill myself, you name it. It's the truth. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I'm glad that you're still here to tell us your story. Mm -hmm. I just had a thought of it in listening, and you were talking about the importance of listening to people with lived experience. Um, and uh, I guess I wanted to talk um, partly about the importance of not just listening between doctors and patients, but people at large listening, especially government listening. And actually, I have seen we have seen good things moving in that direction. We just um, my name's Lori Cook, and I'm a member of Eastern Shore Mental Health. Um, we've got three of us that came in tonight. Uh, and uh, we just are in the process of completing a research project on the Eastern Shore to show people what exactly is needed on the Eastern Shore. For instance, the mobile pro crisis intervention unit will not come down that way. So that's a real lack in our area. So I'd just like to expand on the point that we need to do more listening in a broad range of things, including the doctor-patient relationship. Um, but, uh, and, and just mention that as a note that we need to, to be looking at more of how we can communicate lived experience on a broad range of things and get the kind of support we need for the mental health that is obviously a real issue and is often ignored. But I do feel like there is movement to recognize things and expand on that in many ways. Thank you very much for those comments. I think maybe the panelists might like to react a bit on that. Uh, on how to bring services to the more rural areas of the province, that where the distances are bigger and, and where it's harder to um, to bring the services. I don't know if anyone might like comment on that. Well, I'll just speak from, from the police perspective, um, and I I'm I'm going to speak from the police perspective, but I'm speaking personally as well. I can't see why the mobile mental health crisis team couldn't be made a provincial-led type team. <coughs> we have capital health, we have police agencies, we have health boards all through the province. My, oh, no, I don't Oh, it's still not on. My 
check one, two, one, two. Um, I can't see why it couldn't be something provincial. Maybe that's something that I know we modeled, I believe we modeled our mobile mental health crisis team from Toronto or Ontario of some sort. So if it's working, and I don't know because I'm not working for the team, but certainly I use them almost on an hourly basis when I'm on shift. Um, I, it would be something that I think we could work towards. And then we are still going with a unified approach. But again, that's me speaking personally, not necessarily professionally. My turn. So here's the other end about why uh, the crisis team, the mobile crisis team, can't necessarily be available across the province. Um, we're a pretty small population, and uh, I know that every person counts, so it's very hard is when you have to reconcile the fact that you only have limited resources and limited people available, uh, but you do have to provide a provincial service as much as you can. So what we try to do with the mobile crisis piece is that we do now have the crisis phone line available across the province, which means anyone can call any time. And because we can't necessarily support a team um, in various places across the province, what we can do is uh, make connections with the local um, mental health and addictions programs, and we can make connections with the local police and the local EHS. So if it's determined through that phone call that more is needed, then um, a wellness visit can be made by police, or if someone needs to be taken to the uh, hospital, uh, to the emergency department, then that can be arranged through EHS. So what we're trying to do is uh, use our resources as wisely as possible to make as much of that service uh, available to as many people as possible. Um, it is a really good service and it, it's, um, uh, I heard one described uh, from Alberta once and I kept saying to myself, ours is so much better, ours is so much better. Anyway, I frequently do that when I'm listening to uh, people from across the country. Um, Anyway, I, we have tried to make uh, as much of a crisis uh, service available across the province as possible because there are remote areas that it's a little um, more challenging to uh, just staff. We just uh, we don't have the resources, both financial and human, to do that. But we do want to make sure people have access when they need it. I'm a brand new employee with provincial peer support. Um, Program? Actually, I just got. Oh my, I'm nervous. I'm sorry. <laughs> I would hope that as the peer support program rules out, that the supports that we as peer supporters can offer in the rural communities may help to reduce the amounts of, of emergency types of situations. And it would be really great working together with. People. I um, I work in Truro and mostly, but I live in Stuyak and I and I was interviewing for my job. That was something I said I was comfortable with traveling in our in our county and that too because I could see where there be, there would be people who maybe can't get to a central location. It would be great to be able to help them some supports in their community. So hopefully, I hope that can be a good part of building on that too. Traveling across the country as I have been doing the last few months, uh, this this issue of um, how to uh, bridge that divide between places that are more sparsely populated and the, and the big cities is everywhere. In fact, I would say <coughs> Scotia's problem is very much less than if you lived in a Saskatchewan or, or Manitoba where, you live, where the communities are hundreds of miles apart and very little in between. So uh, it is, and this is a problem everywhere. Um, and it's not for just for emergency services, which are the, the ones that come to mind immediately, of course, and are extremely important, but in every other way as well, to, to um, allow people to uh, be served at the same level um, in distant places as they are within the city. There are all kinds of issues, transportation issues, um, uh, all kinds of reasons why, and, and blockages to, to, the, um, to services being delivered better than they are. And you know Patricia's mentioning of the, the 
the telephone line is maybe the kernel of the secret that we're going to have to use technology uh, much more um, sensibly and much more um, ably than we have up to now to, to deal with, uh, with that problem. There's a conference just uh, going to take place in Toronto in the next couple of days with the uh, Chiefs of Police and uh, the Mental Health Commission of Canada jointly sponsored. And I think it was mostly triggered by some of the dreadful events uh, that have happened between police and, and uh, people in the community uh, to look at, at how our systems can, can be improved for dealing with those crisis kinds of situations. And uh, just as part of my position, I was asked to be on an advisory panel to, uh, about the content of, of that uh, meeting, which was an interesting experience. Um, and I had to remind the people that they were, they were looking at demonstration projects, and they went from Los Angeles, Boston, Philadelphia, Boston, <coughs> uh, and the big cities, but no mention of anywhere uh, where, there, where there was an attempt to deliver services rurally. So they, I believe they have redressed that, and they are going to try to look at um, finding somebody who could speak to that topic or who have ideas about how they, that, uh, that could be better addressed. Uh, I just, I guess, I was also shocked by the lack of adverse effects. I didn't, you know, you you watch TV and you see the sort of the uh, liability claims that they make, and they go on and on and on and on, and and so that has actually given me, I think, a sense, a sense of, sorry, a false sense of. Um, that there's been research around this and that they know and they're warning the one little guy somewhere that had a reaction is being brought forward. Anyway, so thank you for dashing that, what was clearly a lie and clearly a myth. Uh, I really would love to see this risk.org, um, some type of mechanism. Most of the work on the uh, ED at uh, Canadian Mental Health in Pearl, and many of our people come to us and they're suffering from side effects and they don't know how to manage them and we don't know how to support you know we can suggest water exercise eating no sleeping well if you can't sleep i mean that's just that's ridiculous advice mm -hmm. you just feel like you're not giving um, information that's helpful and um, accurate and so if we were able to have some sort of mechanism that we could support our the people that we work with that their voice is valid, and this is something that needs to be of a concern. Um, I just think it would just go so much farther. I love the idea of Risk.org, and I hope that we could um, get something similar going in this area. Yeah. Right. <coughs> I'm Jeff, and Mike Margie, I'm one of the first uh, um, peer support specialists who will be starting it as paid within the formal my healthcare system, and thank you so much, Patricia. You've done so much for us all. Um, I, I really picked on what Dr. Hilda was saying, was talking about the relationship between the person with lived experience and whoever they're dealing with. And I can't stress enough the fastest way to shut us down is to not treat us as being valid for what we're saying, that what we say is not of value and not being taken seriously. If that happens, it's good by Charlie. And I think that to foster, um, I've been working with the doctors on this PSP program, um, and my sort of reaction was that, I think well, the doctor was saying that, well, I, I've got nobody I can relate to and I'm a bit nervous. I said, you've got your colleagues sitting right beside you in the room. I've got this blank look back and oh, yeah, the patient. And I said, if you treat your patients as colleagues, you're going to do brilliantly. I'm like Mike a lot. I'm looking for the solutions. <laughs> yeah, what are the areas to, of doctors? Please? Like, how do you, or how can, say, Capital Health or no, the Department of Health and all this throat notes go to, how do we change that mindset of psychiatry, you know, like to start really working and listening to um, their clients and their families. You know, it really is like a paradigm shift that they have to make. And I know the younger generation coming in, I know they're 
the education, they have, uh, you know, I'm sure they, they have a lot of peer support and family and whatever, but what about the psychiatrists that have been around for a while and, then, you know, they're set? So is there any plan or any, any way that you can implement some kind of client-friendly workshop or, you know, whatever, some education that all psychiatrists, you know, it's part of, you know, you have to do this within the next three years, you, you take this workshop. Has there been any talk, or is that even a possibility? I would say, if you're saying that mental health is going to take a workshop, what about the psychiatrist saying the workshop with the mental health? Well, I'm not saying it's a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, and bring in, of course, you know, yes. clients as part of an education program for current psychiatrists. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure that workshops would be the best. Well, part. whatever, presentation. Yeah. There's a very interesting initiative by the, res the Residence Training in Psychiatry at the, the University of Toronto over the last few years, where um, uh, on an evening, once a week or every couple of weeks, um, they take off their <coughs> and, and get into their genes and they go out to a social place and get together with people who come to their clinics. And they sit down and they talk about anything and everything um, that comes to mind. And so, I, you know, in answer to you, there's hope in the younger generation. Um, uh, I think we have an up, more uphill struggle for those who are set in their ways. But uh, I certainly think uh, Nick would be open to any suggestions for, uh, that are probably can. But that idea is very good. I mean, that, that sounds... Yeah. yeah, I thought it was brilliant. What about our generation, my generation? Can I just add a quick on this one? I think probably your best hope is with an older psychiatrist rather than a younger one. If I raise these issues with younger people, they say we're trained to communicate. And we don't believe what you say. We're trained to communicate compared with the older guys around the place. They're trained to break bad news. They're not trained to hear bad news. They don't listen as well as an older doctor might. But in a world where evidence-based medicine and controlled trials rather than the individual patient's voice is what counts. So they're even less likely to listen for <coughs> who's been in the field for a while and who trust their own judgment is often better. So in a sense, it's about how to get back to the 1950s but it can't be the old style doctor patient thing, which is very much parent child. It's got to be a much more cooperative thing. And the partnership. Yeah. A question yeah. here, please. Yeah, yeah. Um, along these lines, one of the things that I see happening in the last 10 years, maybe longer, is that uh, psychology has made great inroads in terms of some of the treatments for mental illnesses. Mm -hmm. And what I would like to ask the psychiatrists who are present would be, do they th feel threatened by that, those, those advances? And if they don't feel threatened, will they welcome those advances? And the last point is that I want to make is, personally, my, my own daughter has been recently diagnosed with um, borderline personality disorder and the wait list in capital health is I've been told 24 months and I find that to be absolutely unreasonable and I'd like an answer as to why that is. The last question is for Patricia. <laughs> <laughs> we, we love psychologists uh, really and we would like to see a whole lot more of them as part of our system um, for sure and uh, part of the problem is that we don't have enough psychologists. So, no problem to answer that. But the question is the funding of the system, and uh, we just need more funding. Well, I think we're coming up to 8 o'clock. Um, this is going to be, is there one more? Because there's an opportunity. Okay, okay, one, two more. Okay, two more questions. Uh, because there's going to be an opportunity for some informal chatting and refreshments and so on. So let's have two more. Yeah. <laughs> Your best 
sister, daughter, and mother of people with mental health issues. I've been a foster parent. I've been a respite care worker. I also work as an EPA with people with mental health issues. To the police officer, God bless your heart, you have no idea how important you are in the front line. When you walk into someone's home and they're in the middle of a crisis, as soon as that person sees you, the person who's called asking for help, automatically, I'm not alone. The person that's in the middle of the crisis, automatically, diffusion occurs. Because here's a person of authority, we've been trained from the time we're small, don't question, do. So if there's an issue with getting some meds into a person immediately in order to bring them down, you walking in have the ability to make that happen. Don't ever undercut yourself in that situation. You are more important than you could ever imagine. I've gone to the hospital with my son while he's been in rages. Those officers have come with me. Two officers in particular have come over. They, 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 got me, they used to have our place. <coughs> they would stay. When their shift was done, they would call home from the hospital. They would call home. One officer, it was his wife's birthday, and said, I can't leave right now. I've been here with her before with her son. He's crying. He wants help. He wants to kill himself instead of hurt somebody again. I can't leave. I need to tell these doctors what's going on so they can help. In regards to the doctor from, the, from Dalhousie, Somebody asked, how do you teach a person to go to educate the older doctors? And you see that the young doctors are there to converse with you? No. We had an older doctor who, adverse medications? Yes. Uh, prescribed medication. My son repeatedly <coughs> said, it's making me angry. It's not, I can't calm down. No one will listen. And she wouldn't listen. I was with him. Once a week, we would meet with somebody and he'd say, it's still making me angry. It's not helping. He would have blackouts, adverse effects of medication. He tried to pull him, he didn't realize he took his medication. He goes, Mom, I think I took all my pills, but I don't know. The bottle was empty. Side effects of this medication. It ended up being a younger psychiatrist who was a resident, a young resident, who kept advocating for us and said, you know what? I don't know what more I can do, but I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep calling. Someone has to listen. Someone has to help you. And if they don't, come back to me. You come find me here. He gave it, this is where I'm going to be on a Wednesday. This is where you'll find me. Come find me. And he did. He helped. At the end of it, the best advocate for your, for your, for whoever it is or for yourself is you. Important phrase to learn this is not acceptable. That is huge. This is not acceptable. Because we're all whole persons. 
and deal with mental health every day. Um, are aware that adverse effects is a serious problem, and I'm wondering how the provincial strategy is looking at that. If the strategy is looking at that issue. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's particularly outlined in the strategy, mm -hmm. um, but I know we're looking at I wouldn't say it's particularly outlined in the strategy, but I know we're looking at um, the whole use of uh, drugs and uh, the problems that that causes. Uh, so maybe as part of, some, uh, part of that work, we can certainly consider this uh, now that it's you know sort of being raised as uh, quite a big concern because obviously it is. <coughs> okay. Well, uh, I think my my role is, uh, as the moderator of the panel is over. Susan's going to come up and drop things off for this. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for moderating the panel, Nick. Thank you, panel members. Thank you, Dr. Healy. Um, we're going to bring the evening to a close shortly by uh, offering you some uh, refreshments over in the corner uh, and a chance to have some conversation, further conversations. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Todd and, and Dave for their, their technical assistance in the Schizophrenia Society of Nova Scotia for helping to figure all of this out. Technical, technical. If you're not already a member of the Mental Health Coalition, please feel free to sign up on our Mental Health Coalition mailing list. You'll hear about future events um, and, uh, and news of, of import. Um, oh, we want to make sure that you know about the Mental Health Co uh, Coalition Forum that will be hosted in Truro on October the 6th. This is an annual event for the Mental Health Coalition, and uh, I'm sure that uh, if you haven't already uh, registered for the coalition list, you should to find out more about what's going to be happening at that event. And don't be intimidated if you don't have email. Because I will make personal phone calls about names. I've got it down that I can do 26 names in 17 minutes. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Thank you very much for coming on. Okay, enjoy the rest of your evening. There are refreshments over there, and take good care.